and to all the conference organizers, Ian, uh, Patricia and Carly for a, a wonderful uh, conference and a range of panels. And uh, in this instance, for the opportunity to focus uh, a discussion on Edna O'Brien, timely in so many ways, not least because she has now has now some of the recognition she richly deserves as a writer and public figure. Just um, for those joining before we, we, we start and kick off with uh, Maureen O'Connor, a reminder to keep cameras and mics turned off until the papers have been concluded uh, and a question session will follow after that. If you have questions that strike you along the way and you, you want to put uh, questions into the chat box, uh, we can come back to those at the very end of all the papers and, um, and, and uh, you can ask questions uh, with your mic as well. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Maureen O'Connor, who uh, is based at University College Cork, and her title of her talk is Edna O'Brien, Eco-Warrior. Maureen. Thank, thank you also uh, from me to Ian and Trish and Carly and to, to Catherine for making this all happen. And my title, I'm a little embarrassed because I think this is less maybe aggressive call to arms than I had first thought it would be. But um, so. You know, in the context of this conference, it's important to remember, um, you know, Eamon made some reference to this, but Edna O'Brien's fictional girls and her own girl self are all, were all deeply influenced by the Roman Catholic Church, especially when it comes to the figure of the Virgin Mary. In the opening chapter of her first and best known novel, Country Girls from 1960, Koch Brady announces her intention to become a nun and refers to her nightly practice of, quote, getting out of bed six or seven times as an act of penance. In her most recent novel, 2019's Girl, Catholic nuns offer sanctuary to the protagonist, Mariam, who has escaped from Boko Haram, who have kidnapped, kidnapped her and other schoolgirls. <clears throat> in her 2012 memoir, The Country Girl, O'Brien reveals that in recognition of her devoutness and obedience, she was, quote, given the honor of playing Our Lady of Fatima in the school play. Nerves overcome her, she recollects, however, and she tumbles down from the throne of butter boxes that she's been thrown on, uh, and an understudy gets to actually play the part. Um, so I'm going to use that image of young Edna tumbling from the heights of devotion as a kind of maybe obnoxious metaphor for her fortunate fall from identifying at least doctrinally as a Catholic. Of her fellow exile and literary mentor, and that's the word she often uses to refer to James Joyce, O'Brien has observed, quote, he broke the Catholic Church when still in his teens, but in another sense, he never left it. He couldn't. And what I'm quoting is um, O'Brien's biography of Joyce, uh, quote, I'm continuing. Um, maybe Lauren is, or someone's mic is on. I'm sorry, I'm hearing a lot. No, Lauren is not, it's someone else. Um, I'm hearing crunchy sounds, like someone's having crisps. It makes me want to have some crisps. Um, he liked blackberry jam because Christ's crown of thorns came from that wood and he wore purple cravats during Lent. He went to church on special occasions, both because he liked the singing and because the Catholic liturgy and ritual represented the oldest mysteries of humanity. And why am I quoting from her biography of Joyce? Because it has been identified by a number of reviewers as a quote, passionate testimony of kinship. And those are the words of Dermot Kelly. <clears throat> In an earlier autobiographical work, Mother Ireland from 1976, O'Brien says of her homeland, quote, there must be something secretly catastrophic about a country from which so many people go, escape, and that something alongside the economic exigencies that sent over a million in coffin ships when a blight hit the potato crop in 1847 and has been sending them in considerable numbers ever since. So she kind of gets out of the way, the chronicled historical conditions behind mass emigration before she goes on to identify the possibly secret catastrophes that drive the Irish out of Ireland. Quote, loneliness, the longing for adventure, the Roman Catholic Church, or the family tie that is more umbilical than any other race on earth. The sanctity of the family comprises one of the foundations of the post-independence Irish nation, nation state and Irish identity, both reliant on a self-image of a distinctive and fervent Roman Catholic piety, as well as the maintenance of traditional filial values of hearth and home. As Geraldine Meany has observed, quote, in post-colonial Southern Ireland, a particular construction of sexual and familiar roles became the very substance of what it means to be Irish. Well, certainly for this audience, I don't need to rehearse 
the um, revelations that have been especially kind of frequent and shocking in the 21st century of the consequences of the regime of the control of sexuality, especially women's, that has been central to the institutions of family, state, and church in Ireland. <clears throat> we all know about, uh, unfortunately, we all know too much. <laughs> that it's very quite painful to hear the details of the clerical sex abuse um, that O'Brien also wrote about from the very beginning. It's a plot point in A Pagan Place from 1970 and in the forest in 2002. The uh, mother and baby homes, Chum, Vespero, the Magdalen Laundries, these have also uh, been featured in uh, O'Brien's fiction. For example, in August is a Wicked Month, which uh, was the first novel to appear after the Country Girls trilogy in 1965. The character of Ellen describes herself as having, quote, been brought up to believe in punishment, sin in a field, and then the long, awful spell in the Magdalen, scrubbing it out, down on her knees, getting cleansed. The narrator of the short story from 1974, House of My Dreams, <clears throat> recalls her sister being sent to a Magdalen laundry after an unsuccessful attempt at a self-abortion. Uh, in a pagan place, preparations are made to send the narrator's unmarried sister to a mother and baby home where, quote, it was already arranged that Emma's baby would be handed over to the state a few seconds after it was born. And then down by the river in 1997, we all know was based on the X case of just a few years previous, 1994, when a 14 year old rape victim was stopped from uh, traveling to England for an abortion. <clears throat> In her introduction to the latest reissue of the Country Girls trilogy by Faber and Faber, uh, Emer McBride identifies the novelist's understanding of the, quote, struggle for women's voices to be heard above the clamor of an ultra-conservative, ultra-religious, and institutionally misogynist society. So there's abundant evidence of O'Brien's alienation from the official Catholic Church in Ireland, but I think there is quite a bit of evidence in her writing of an emotional attachment to and longing for what we might call religious qualities, the kind of residuum that Eamon was referring to later. Um, uh, I liked uh, uh, Tom Inglis's phrase of not throwing out the religious baby with the with the Catholic bathwater. I have that in my margin. Um, <clears throat> so things like prayerfulness, sense of connection, hope of redemption, a place in creation. And I see her realizing these kinds of long for uh, qualities through the natural world. Now, uh, the, the, the church historians will set me straight on this, but um, I see this as possibly an evocation of a pre-Tridentine pre Irish Catholicism that was landscape-based, perhaps more animist in its sensibilities. The kind of practices that really persisted, as Kevin Whelan has argued, in more remote, remote rural, kind of northern and western parts of the country um, into the 19th century. The Mariolatry of O'Brien's most emotive and vivid description, a depiction of her young girl's Catholic faith strikes me as significant in this particular regard. For one thing, the Virgin Mother uh, and the intensely loved, if also resented, material mother are often conflated by O'Brien's protagonists. Um, and I'm going to look at some, a particular recurring set of images that can be considered, as one character puts it, sacrilegious. But it is rather a sacralizing of the material, the bodily, the imminent, long associated with the feminine in the Western world, rather than the transcendent, traditionally male identified. And that is the mother's menstrual blood, which reoccurs as an unexpected object of fascination in the fiction, if not veneration. In Christaven terms, the female subject in O'Brien resists, resists the proper developmental movement from fascination to shame in treating the maternal body. <clears throat> in the 1964 story Chords, Claire spends a tense, unhappy weekend with her disapproving Irish mother who's visiting her in London for the first time and thinks that Claire is leading a life of dissipation. Distressed about the disastrous attempt at reconciliation, Claire has jumbled memories of forbidden street sweets, hidden razor blades, and her mother's blood, as well as the chapel sanctuary light, quote, a bowl of blood with a flame laid into it. In 1992's Time and Tide, we get something similar in a letter Nell, Nell writes to her mother, in which she reproaches her mother for not preparing her daughter for the onset of menses, despite the fact that, as Nell says in the letter, she had, course, she had of course, quote, seen your napkins in the bowls of water put there to soak, the water blood red like the oil in the sanctuary lamp, but otherwise carnal. The unnamed protagonist of A Rose in the Heart, 1978, 
similarly blends the sacramental with maternal bleeding. Quote, she was trying to start afresh to wipe out the previous life. She was staggered by the assaults of memory, a bowl with her mother's menstrual cloth soaking in it, and her sacrilegious idea that if lit, it could resemble the heart of Christ. So why is that significant for my purposes here is that the Virgin Mary is potentially a connection to the animist pagan past of Irish religious practice that invests every element of creation with liveliness. According to Joelle Mellon, quote, places long associated with goddess worship in many European countries were frequently transformed into sacred Marian sites. It was the Irish, however, who seemed to take this to this idea with the greatest relish. In Ireland, 86% of all Christian shrines, including Our Lady of Knock, are based on wells once dedicated to the pagan goddess Bridget. That reminds me of some of the women that uh, Tom Inglis interviewed. So an example in the High Road 1988 novel, which revolves around a passionate relationship between Anna, an Irish visitor to a Spanish island, and Catalina, a native of that island. Catalina's village practices a pagan version of Catholicism. The older Anna follows the Stations of the Cross to a church, which is also, quote, the seat of the Iberian moon goddess. And this goddess is an object of worship, not easily distinguished in this scene from the Virgin Mary to whom prayers are being offered in a, quote, subhuman drone. According to Helen Thompson, quote, the Catholic litany to the Virgin Mother that Anna hears in the church could also be a chanting ritual in honor of the moon goddess because religion and mysticism are conflated here. The realm of dream and archaic myth are unselfconsciously merged here with the newer myth of Catholicism's Virgin Queen. As O'Brien said in a 1968 interview with Bolivar Lefranc, quote, she, she was, quote, quote, very committed to my mythology, which is Roman Catholic. Interesting way of talking about uh, Catholicism as a set of myths. <clears throat> The truth and beauty, the timelessness of O'Brien's often painfully honest observations about human emotion and relationships is rarely connected, critically anyway, to another distinguishing quality of her writing, that is her astonishing powers of description of the natural world. In a 1958 essay for the journal The Writer, written two years before the publication of The Country Girls, O'Brien describes the act of writing as necessarily collaborative, a process which harnesses, in Jane Bennett's phrase, quote, nature is creativity. And now I have a few sentences from the 58 piece by O'Brien. In the subliminal depths of my writing, I am aware of a yearning to make contact. And I remind myself that we are all of the earth. We have felt rain, heat, cold, wind. We have all known grass under our feet, stars overhead. We have all touched trees, flowers, water, rock, etc. There on the earth somewhere, my characters and I meet, I feel something about the part of earth they come out of. So writing is experienced here as a communal project. The writer works in creative collaboration with the non-human. And this sense of shared creativity retains a humble, respectful awareness of and receptivity to powers beyond the human and the mystery of our place in the world. Talking to David Haycock, O'Brien said that her ambition in writing A Pagan Place was to produce a, quote, extremely non-literary book, meaning that the narrative is not structured according to normative expectations for the literary novel, but is indebted instead to the kind of, um, oh, page got away from me, the kind of <clears throat> uh, organic storytelling that she experienced in childhood. Quote, I was brought up very much on mythology and folk tales. Decades later, in a piece written for the Irish Independent in 1990 called In the Sacred Company of Trees, O'Brien again refers to mythology when revealing a connection between her younger self and the narrator of a pagan place. Quote, I grew up surrounded by trees and trees are important to me. My mythology instilled in me the notion that they were sacred. In Ireland, around our house, we had huge primeval groaning trees. There was a fort of oak trees that I believed were druidic. She says trees, quote, were more then anything in nature carry a sense of continuity. The narrator of a pagan place behaves like a druid, reading the natural world for signs and portents, turning to alternative sources of understanding away from the dominant orthodox modes of inquiry and communication that are ordering and containing her and her sister's lives. Trees are mythic presences for O'Brien, as in many spiritual traditions, they are sacred and inspirational to young Mariam in Girl. Though nominally Christian, she reveres the local deity the tree spirit. In a prize-winning essay for school, Mariam writes, quote, ancestors who have died live there and govern lives. 
they ward off evil. If those sacred trees are harmed or lopped or burnt, ancestors get very angry and sometimes take revenge. Claire Wills has argued that the generation of women, women who, uh, uh, of Irish women, important, who feature centrally in most of O'Brien's fiction, are situated at a quote juncture between the values of enlightenment and tradition. And it's not possible, she argues, in a context, in such a context, to quote dissolve the realm of fantasy and myth. And she warns that the feminist critic needs to quote be wary of the argument that the truth of individual women's experience can undercut the myths and mystifications which have surrounded her image in Irish culture. O'Brien demystifies Irish womanhood by perhaps paradoxically remythologizing her experience. Her own embodied experience is indelibly marked by Catholicism, which she is no more able to entirely leave behind than is her beloved Joyce. This despite being reviled and banned by the Irish church. Its most eminent representative, Catholic primate of Ireland and Archbishop of, of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid called her quote, a renegade and a dirty one. But as she noted many years ago with characteristically blunt and unsparing imagery, quote, we inhabit an obscene declining capitalist society. To draw attention to obscenity in writing is to squeeze pus out of the already existing abscess. She was once thought of as a dirty woman and writer, marginalized and pilloried. In her 90th year, O'Brien knows the real obscenity and the sources of the irredeemable filth of the world. Thank you.